BTEC Applied Science Unit 1 Biology paper. Uh, this is a sample assessment. So you've got two papers I've done now. Um, any exam, write neatly in black pen, bring a ruler. Uh, you're going to have to measure some stuff. Uh, bring your own calculator and know how to use it. Uh, look at how many marks there are for the question. If you haven't got a clue, leave it, come back to it later, write something down. Um, 30 minutes should be enough, so don't panic, but you do have to get your skates on. You haven't got time to have a little kip or anything like that. Uh, these are the instructions on the front of the paper. Again, the three exams used to be all together. They've split it up, so you do one at a time now. When you're doing this video, I suggest you have a go at the questions yourself before you look at my answers. I think that would be the best way to revise. OK, look at the question, have a go at it yourself, pen, paper, calculator, then look at my answers. So let's go. And if I make any mistakes, by the way, let me know. Uh, I have made a couple of mistakes recently, and I'm very, very grateful for people who point it out. OK, so let me know if I make any stupid mistakes, which which I, I never do me. So ciliated cells are found in the human lung. Uh, what is the name of the lung tissue that contains ciliated cells? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It's columnar epithelium is what it is. It's it's these guys here. So, yeah, they're like these epithelial tissue. And you've got your, your cilia on the top there. The cilia are like little hairs on the inside of the airway and they vibrate and they carry uh, dust and rubbish, you know, out of the airway, you know, to the throat where you might swallow it or spit it out or whatever. So it's columnar epithelium is what it is. Uh, chemicals in cigarette smoke reduce the movement of cilia. So <coughs> there's a cough. Uh, explain how reducing the movement of the cilia can result in a smoker having to cough. Well, so basically, as I said, the um, the cilia, these things here, the cilia um, vibrate. There's mucus and bits of dust and rubbish and garbage, bits of, of rubbish and garbage gets trapped in the mucus and then the cilia vibrate and they carry it out of the airway, okay? Now, if the cilia aren't working properly because they've been damaged, then how, how is the smoker gonna get rid of this rubbish? And all they can do is cough. So my answer is uh, dust and pathogens are trapped in mucus, uh, then the cilia vibrate to remove them from the airway. If the movement of the cilia is reduced, then the smoker must cough to remove this stuff. Uh, figure one shows the ultrastructure of an animal cell. So this is an animal cell. Uh, which of these labels is the Golgi apparatus or Golgi apparatus? And you should remember, it's the very first video, it's A. A is the Golgi apparatus, this thing here, okay? Uh, state two functions of the Golgi apparatus. Um, Mainly it is, so here's my answer, it receives proteins from the ER, uh, uh, it modifies them, it sorts them, it packages them in, into vesicles, uh, and then it sends them off to other places. So it's like the post office, yeah? It receives these proteins, it packages them, and then it sends them off, okay? That's probably worth two marks, but I put also it produces lysosomes as well, just to get me money's worth. Uh, name an organelle found in a plant cell that is not present in this animal cell. And you should remember from your year seven science lessons, the obvious ones are uh, chloroplasts uh, and cell walls. OK, they're the obvious ones one of them now uh, this is where a lot of students will struggle the actual length of the mitochondrion 
in the animal cell is 10 micrometers. Uh, calculate the magnification of the mitochondrion in the image. Now, on the exam paper, uh, you will have this picture uh, and the image of the mitochondrion here. What you'll do is you'll get your ruler and you'll measure it with your ruler uh, and you'll get it to be 12 millimeters. Yeah, it should be 12 millimeters. So what's the magnification? And show your working. So we remember I am sure that you remember how to do this. So I am, okay. So if we want to work out the magnification, then we cover that up. So the magnification is the size of the image divided by the actual size. Now the size of the image is in millimeters uh, and we can't divide millimeters by micrometers. It's either all got to be millimeters or all micrometers. Now you should know that there's a thousand micrometers in a millimeter. Yeah. So uh, my 12 millimeters is 12,000 micrometers. So 12,000 in micrometers. I don't need units because they're going to cancel. The actual size is 10. See, it says 10.0. So my magnification is 1,200. And that doesn't have any units. So 1,200. Uh, oh, a lot of reading here for three marks. Mitochondria contain DNA. Now, uh, mutations in the DNA in mitochondria can cause mitochondrial disease. These mutations can be inherited. Uh, in 2015, the UK became the first country in the world to allow three parent babies. Producing a three parent baby removes the risk of the baby inheriting mutated DNA. Figure doodah shows some of the steps involved in producing a three parent baby. So basically you've got an egg from the mother. There's the mother's egg and looking at this diagram. So what have they done? They've taken the nucleus from the mother's egg. OK, now where have they put this nucleus? Well, they've got some donor here. So another lady has donated an egg and they've got rid of the nucleus in the donor egg. So you've got this egg without a nucleus and you put the mother's nucleus in the donor egg. OK, uh, so let's have a look at the table. DNA is, found, DNA is found in mitochondria, right? And in the nucleus. Complete the table to show the source of DNA that contributes to a three parent baby. So from the mother, it's from the nucleus. Yes, uh, from the donor, it's in the mitochondria because we're told in the question that mitochondria has DNA in it. OK, and then from daddy, um, well, that's from uh, sperm. So nucleus, mitochondria, sperm. When the egg is fertilized. Uh, heart disease uh, caused by atherosclerosis is a major problem in the UK. Uh, smoking cigarettes and drinking alcohol are lifestyle factors that increase the risk of atherosclerosis. State one other lifestyle factor. Uh, well, I, I should have put this on up here, but there you go. Lack of exercise, poor diet, in particular too much salt uh, or cholesterol, bad cholesterol, stress. Uh, it asks for one other factor. Um, now, many people in the UK uh, need a heart transplant to replace their uh, diseased heart. A uh, study of the hearts used in transplant operations from donors of different ages was carried out. The percentage of the donor hearts that showed signs of atherosclerosis was measured. Figure three shows the results. So looking at the graph, let's figure out the graph. So at the bottom here, you've got the age range, okay, of the people who donated a heart. Yes. Uh, so that's the different age ranges getting older. Uh, and then you've got the percentage uh, of hearts that showed signs of atherosclerosis. Uh, we're told 
that the number of hearts donated here, the number of hearts donated by people between 20 and 29, the number of hearts was 40. So that 2029, there were 40 hearts. OK, so how many hearts reading the question here now, how many hearts showed signs of atherosclerosis from the age range 20 to 29? Well, looking at the graph, uh, it's a little hard to see on here, but it's 65 percent. OK, so in this bar here, it's 65 percent. So the answer is going to be 65 percent of uh, 40 because there are 40 hearts. So what is 65% of 40? So 40 times 0 0.65 is 26. So the answer is B, 26. Okay. Uh, suggest an explanation why young hearts are the best ones to use. Uh, why would you rather have a young heart? Well, according to the graph, the younger the donor was, the less chance there will be that there will be signs of atherosclerosis. OK, so therefore. Therefore, uh, the graph shows that the younger the heart is, uh, the less likely it is to show signs of atherosclerosis. So the heart muscles will get a better blood supply. Uh, it will therefore pump blood more efficiently and it will last longer. A younger heart will last longer if there's less chance of it having uh, blocked arteries. OK. Nerve impulses. Nerve impulses are important in the control of many activities in the human body. Figure thingy shows uh, changes in the transmembrane potential uh, during the transmission of a nerve impulse. Yeah, so we're, we're familiar with this graph. We've learned it. State the time period when depolarization is taking place. So depolarization, you should look at the graph and say, well, that's from there to there. That's depolarization. And so that is from 0.5 milliseconds to 0.8 milliseconds. OK, that's depolarization. Uh, table two shows how the speed of nerve impulses in different types of axon uh, of the same diameter. So you've got your myelinated axon and your unmyelinated axon. Uh, so the myelinated one has, has got a sheath on the outside. OK, uh, and you will see that the impulses are a lot faster if you've got a myelin sheath. And you have learned, oh, well, I haven't, I haven't, I should have got this appearing, never mind. Explain the difference in speed. So why do nerve impulses travel faster in uh, an axon with a myelin sheath? And you will have learned, because you've done your revision, uh, myelinated axons have Schwann cells and nodes of Ranvier. OK, you don't need to do a diagram, but you remember these things here. So your Schwann cells and then in between them there are the gaps called nodes of Ranvier. Uh, the nerve impulse can jump from one node to the other very quickly. This is called saltatory conduction. This makes the nerve impulse much faster than if the whole axon had to depolarize as the signal traveled through it. OK, so basically, why does the signal travel faster in, a, in an axon which has a, a sheath? And you've learned that. Just regurgitate it. Now, this is a tricky question. Nerve impulses are transmitted across synapses by neurotransmitters. Uh, the diagram shows what happens to a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft. So, I mean, I am familiar with this question. Basically, you've got your pre-synaptic neuron, you've got your post synaptic neuron, you've got the cleft in between uh, and you've got your neurotransmitters kind of go from there to there and that carries this chemical signal. OK, now what happens after it's carried the signal is that these the neurotransmitters should be broken down. 
So after it has carried the signal, this acetylcholine, uh, I think the hardest thing about this question is actually pronouncing some of these words. Cholinesterase, cholinesterase enzyme breaks down the acetylcholine after it's done its job. Uh, and then these chemicals will be reabsorbed and then it can happen again. Now, apparently, uh, organophosphates are chemicals that stop uh, the, this enzyme working. So if it stops the enzyme working, it's going to stop the acetylcholine being broken down. So if this acetylcholine isn't broken down, what's going to happen is that you're going to have lots and lots of neurotransmitter, lots and lots of acetylcholine all of the time. It won't go away. How is that going to kill small animals? Well, it's a pesticide and the way it kills small animals is that this will constantly be depolarized. Yes. And if this is controlling a muscle, then that muscle will be constantly contracted. Yeah, because it will constantly be getting the signal to contract. It's only three marks. Blimey, it took me 20 minutes to read the question. This is my answer. The cholinesterase enzyme breaks down the acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft uh, once the signal has passed across it. If it is not broken down, e.g. because of the pesticide, then there will constantly be a high level of acetylcholine in the cleft. Uh, the postsynaptic membrane would be constantly depolarized. Muscles would constantly be receiving a signal to contract. Uh, this could cause, probably would result in the organism's death. Wow, a lot of hard work for three marks there. Okay, six marks for this one. And this is, I reckon this question is a piece of cake. I reckon it's easy. If you know your stuff, nothing tricky about it. Uh, a young athlete is very good at long distance running, but is not good at sprinting. Uh, discuss how this difference relates to the type of muscle fiber in their legs. So let's have a think. Six marks. This is all about uh, slow twitch and fast twitch. They're the two types of muscle fiber. Uh, this person here has obviously got a lot more slow twitch uh, and that makes them good at, at long distance. Uh, talk about basically uh, have a little plan. Think about how you're going to get six marks. What are the two types of muscle fiber? Uh, which type does this person have more of? Why does that make him or her better at long distance running rather than sprinting? Now, my answer, which I reckon is six marks worth, is uh, slow twitch muscle fibers have more mitochondria, uh, which makes ATP. Uh, so they've got uh, more than fast twitch muscle fibers. Not a very good sentence there. They have more capillaries, so there's a better blood supply. Uh, they have larger oxygen and glucose stores. Uh, because of this, your slow twitch muscle fibers do not tire easily. Uh, they are better for slow contraction over a long period of time as opposed to rapid contraction in short bursts. Uh, so this young person has got more slow twitch muscle fibers than uh, fast twitch 